My name is Rick Renner, and I'm standing in what is called Philosopher's Square, which is right in the heart of central Ephesus, an amazing place. I wish I could pick you up and bring you here to see it yourself. I'm standing in front of the Library of Celsus, which was built in the year 110. Previous to that, probably there was a synagogue here. Behind me are these great arches through which people walked as they entered into the central marketplace. And directly in front of me are the steps leading up to what was called the School of Tyrannus, where the Apostle Paul taught doctrine for two years while he was in Ephesus. In fact, Acts chapter 19 says he taught every morning, every afternoon, every day of the week, teaching the Word of God until finally, the name of Jesus and the teaching of the Bible was known and heard all over Asia. And it was because Paul believed that the Word of God needed to be taught. He believed that people needed a foundation on which to build their lives, and particularly these people, because they were saved out of paganism. They had no idea about the Word of God, what was right, what was wrong. They literally needed someone to take them to school to put them on the principles of good Christian doctrine. That's what doctrine does. And that's why Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, says we need to have the foundational doctrines of Christ in our life. We need to know what the Bible teaches us about our faith, what is our faith. We really need to know the foundations of our faith. That's what I think about when I'm in this amazing place. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. I am so glad to be with you and to be speaking to you today about foundations of faith. It's very important that you know what you believe. In fact, when the book of Hebrews was written, the writer of Hebrews, as we saw in the last program, was very concerned that his readers did not really know what the Bible taught on very basic issues. And he said to them in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12, just for a review, for, when the, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, that which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And we saw that this word ought is the Greek word aphelo, which describes an obligation, a necessity, or a moral duty. It's the equivalent of saying, after everything you've heard, you ought to be further along than you are by now. And in fact, the word teachers, the Greek word didaskaloi, which is the plural form of the word didaskalos. It describes one that is a master teacher, one who is superior in his field of expertise, and it was the same word used to describe rabbis at the time of the New Testament. So when you put all this together, right from the very outset of the verse, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, the writer of Hebrews says, after everything you've heard, after all the sermons you've heard preached, all the church you've attended, everything that's entered your ears and into your eyes, by now you ought, in fact, you're obligated to be able to teach someone else, you ought to be a spiritual rabbi. Wow. I want you to think about your own life, how much you've heard in church. My goodness gracious, you've had a deluge of spiritual information, sermons, teachings, preachings, now the internet and social media. You are inundated with the Word of God coming at you from every direction if you're really interested in ministry. With all of that, you ought to be very far along spiritually. Well, that was exactly the case with these people that the writer of Hebrews was writing to. He said, by now, you yourself ought to be teachers. Instead, he says, you have need that someone teach you the first principles of the oracles of God. When he says you have need, the Greek word krea, it describes a deficit, a lacking. He's identifying their need. He says, you need to be taught, again, the first principles. First, the Greek word arches, which describes something first, the beginning, something that is elementary. The word principle is the Greek word stoikeion, which describes something rudimentary. It is rudimentary knowledge that is required before you can advance to the next level of education. Just like a child, he can't read deep, deep literature until first he learns to read simple literature. He has to be able to read simple English or whatever his language is. He has to be able to read very simple structures and really master that before he can move on to something deeper and more profound. You just can't do the profound if you don't first start with your ABCs. And that's the same with you and me. We have to be established in the first principles of the oracles of God. It is essential 
that we be established in them. In fact, the verse goes on to say in verse 13, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. And we saw that this word unskillful is the Greek word eperos from the word perazo, which means to test. But when you put a privative on the front of it, the word, the letter A, it makes it eperos, which is not something skilled, but something unskilled, something untested, something undeveloped or inexperienced. And here the writer of Hebrews says to you and me, the people who are not really established in foundational truths, they are inexperienced in deep things. They're undeveloped spiritually. They will come to illogical spiritual conclusions. You know, sometimes I hear what people believe and it just amazes me. I don't know about you, but I'm amazed sometimes at what people embrace and what sometimes people believe. I even think to myself, what is wrong with them that they would believe such foolishness? But yet when I look at them, they're very sincere. They're very passionate about the Lord, but they embrace such silliness. And it's evident to me that a lot of it is just spiritual silliness. Why are they embracing it? Because they're not established in fundamental truth. Fundamental truth, rudimentary truth spiritually, the basic doctrines of Christ, they give us a foundation. And that foundation gives us tools. It gives us instruments by which to make decisions, it affects the way we perceive what is right, what is wrong. And those fundamental truths help us to come to correct conclusions. And that's why it is so essential that you have fundamental teaching in your life. Otherwise, Hebrews 5 verse 13 says you'll be unskilled, inexperienced, undeveloped, unskilled. Really, you're headed for trouble if you don't have financial, uh, really strong foundations in your life you'll end up making catastrophic spiritual calculations. And you don't want to do that. Maybe you know someone that's already done that. It's so tragic when people make wrong spiritual decisions. And you know they were very sincere. How did they come to those conclusions? Because they didn't know the ABCs of their faith. And the ABCs are required before you can move on to higher levels. And in fact, today we're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, where this very thought continues. And Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, that word principles, the Greek word our case again, the starting place, the beginning. It's talking about the starting place of our faith. There is a starting place. There's a beginning. It says, let us go on under perfection. Go on is from the Greek word phero, which means to be carried along. And God's intention is not that we get stuck in the first grade. God's intention is that we go on, but you can't go on until you pass the first grade. You've got to have the fundamentals. You've got to have the basics before you can go on and be profound and be deep. First, you have to have the basics. And once the basics are established in your life, then you're able to go on. And then the writer of Hebrews gives us what are the ABCs, or he gives us these fundamentals that are essential for every believer to know in order for him to lead his life correctly, in order for him to come to correct spiritual conclusions, what are the fundamentals that are essential for you and essential for me? Here they are. He says, not laying again, the foundation of repentance from dead works. So first of all, you have to understand what the Bible says about repentance. So let me ask you, do you really know what is repentance? You'd be amazed at how many people who don't even know what the word repent means. But according to this verse, this is a fundamental of your faith. And if you don't know what repentance is, it's likely that you're not even saved because it's impossible to be saved without the act of repentance. So you can see how foundational this is. Then he says, faith toward God. He doesn't just say faith, but he talks about a doctrine that is faith toward God. This is faith rooted in Christ and Christ alone this also is essential for salvation. You're going to see as we continue how very important this is. Then in verse 2, he says, And the doctrine of baptisms, notice it's plural, it's not baptism, it's baptisms. So according to this verse, there are multiple baptisms in the New Testament. And according to Hebrews 6, verse 1 and 2, it is essential for you as a believer to know the doctrine of baptisms. There's something about this doctrine that is foundational to everything else in your Christian life. And you need to understand what is the doctrine of baptisms. Then he says, and the doctrine of the laying on of hands, 
Well, you may think you know what that is. You say, well, that's laying hands on people. But the Bible in this verse says it is a whole doctrine, the doctrine of laying on of hands. This is a central doctrine of the faith. Then he says, and of the resurrection of the dead. This is the very heart of our faith. What does the Bible teach about resurrection? And last, he says, and of eternal judgment. Many people don't even know there is judgment. They think because they're in Christ, judgment is finished. But judgment is never finished. Judgment is a reality that awaits all of us. Those of us that know Christ, we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Those that are unsaved will stand before the great white throne judgment. That's not our judgment. We're in Christ. So we're going to stand before Christ. And the Bible is absolutely clear that all of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we will give account for what we did in this life in the body. The Bible says whether it be good or whether it be bad. Well, that's pretty important. So you can see these are vital doctrines. These are vital foundations to our faith. If you don't understand repentance, you may not even be saved. If you don't understand what the Bible says about repentance, you may not understand your need to repent. If you don't understand what the Bible says about faith toward God, you may not even be saved. This is faith rooted in Christ and Christ alone, not in your works, not in anything you do. It is vital to your faith. And on and on and on, all the way through to eternal judgment. We need to know what the Bible says about all six of these foundational doctrines. And once we're established in them, then we can go on. But are you established in them? Is your friend, your neighbor, your relative, your children, are they established in them? I know that when our sons were young, Denise and I would gather them around the table and we would speak to them about the Bible. We would ask them what they believe, what does the Bible say? We took every opportunity to speak the Word of God to our children because we wanted our children to think right. And when you know the Bible, you think right. When you know the Bible, it gives you a sense of what's right and what's wrong. The Bible gives you common sense. Actually, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom or the beginning of knowledge. This is where real wisdom, real knowledge, real common sense comes from. And as we saw in the last program, when the Word of God exercises you, it brings you into a state of spiritual adulthood where you're able to handle life, handle the affairs of life. You want that for yourself. You want that for your children, for your friends. We all want to be spiritual adults. We don't want to be on the milk. We don't want to be infants for the rest of our life. Well, the first doctrine that is listed in verse 1 is repentance from dead works. And the Bible calls it the foundation of repentance from dead works. The word foundation is the Greek word thamelios from the word tithemi, which means to lay, to place, or position, and the word lithos, which is the word stone. When you put these two words together, it means to set something in stone, which means this issue of repentance, which is the first doctrine mentioned in these verses, is so vital, it is so paramount in our life, it should be set in stone. This is something that should never have to be repeated. You should never have to be taught this again, though probably many do need to be taught it again because they were never properly taught it in the first place. Repentance is foundational. It is something that should be set in stone in our life. Well, what is repentance? The word repentance is the Greek word metanoia. The word meta carries the idea of a change. And the word noia is from the Greek word nous, which is the word for the mind. But when you compound the two words together, meta and nous, it forms the word metanoia. And the word metanoia describes a change of mind. Listen careful a complete conversion, a turn, a change of behavior, a new course, a completely altered view of life and behavior, or a decision to believe, think, and act differently. In this word repent, there is not a hint of emotion. Not a hint of emotion. The entire word is intellectual. It is a decision to think different, to believe different, and it is a change of believing, a change of thinking that results in a change of behavior. This is not someone just saying they want to change, but this is someone deciding to be different. They're deciding to turn, deciding to change. They are repenting 
and they bring forth the fruits of repentance or a lifestyle change that proves their repentance is genuine. Now, that's what repentance is. It is a decision. It is a decision. And that's why many evangelistic ministries and ministries and churches record how many decisions happened at the altar. A decision, we understand, is someone that prays to receive Christ, they get saved, but it's often recorded as a decision for Christ. That's because the word repent really means to make a decision. Now, many people think they repent and they don't. An example is from Matthew chapter 27, verse 3, where the Bible talks about Judas Iscariot. And the Bible says that Judas Iscariot, having seen what he did, repented, and he went out and hanged himself. Well, you know, hanging yourself really is not the fruit of repentance. Then what does the Bible say when the Bible says that he repented himself? Matthew 27, verse 3. That is a very different Greek word. The word repent, the word repent that describes us and our behavior and what's required by God is the word metanoia, a change of mind, a decision to think different, to believe different, to act different. But when the Bible talks about Judas Iscariot repenting, it's the word metamelomai. It doesn't even sound the same. And the word metamelomai is a Greek word which describes profound sorrow, someone that is engulfed in grief. It is a completely emotional word, has nothing to do with the ability to decide or to make a choice, just to be swallowed in regret, to be swallowed in remorse. He didn't repent. Judas Iscariot didn't make a decision for Christ. He didn't make a decision to turn his life around. He was just swallowed in sorrow for what he did, and the sorrow engulfed him until he committed suicide. Now I'm going to illustrate this. When I was five years old, I got saved. And I really knew what I was doing at the age of five. We had an evangelist come to our church, and he preached a series of revival meetings. And I remember one service where he preached on the subject of hell, and he was so vivid in the way that he preached. As a four-year-old, I could see the flames of hell. And that night I understood that I was a sinner, I became accountable for my life, and I knew that I needed to repent. A year later, I finally walked the aisle. And when I walked the aisle, I didn't feel great sorrow. I didn't even feel great sorrow for sin. I was five years old. What sin was I going to be sorry for? But I knew I needed to make a decision. I knew that I needed to repent. And one reason I knew is because my mother had really taught me what was repentance. I needed to make a decision for Christ, that I was going to give my life to Him and serve Him for the rest of my life. And when I was five years old, on that Sunday morning, I walked forward, I made a decision, I repented. I had a change of mind, I was going to live for the Lord. Well, in a very short period of time, I was thrown into confusion because I saw adults come down to the front and they would weep and wail and nearly empty boxes of tissue crying at the altar. And I was so moved by their tears. But I would see them get up and walk out of the church and maybe not come back for a year. Their emotions seemed so real. And yet they didn't come to church. There was no change of their life. They got up, they walked out, they didn't come back. And I saw this happen over and over and over. And I would think to myself, Rick, why didn't you cry when you repented? These people are really crying. They feel such emotion, such sorrow for what they did. You didn't even cry. You just made a decision. And as time went by, growing up in church, watching church people, I began to understand. Some of those people, not all of them, but some of them, they weren't repenting. They were just sorrowful. They were filled with remorse for what they had done. They really weren't able to make a decision to change because they were so involved in their emotions. Sometimes emotion really prohibits you from making a decision. And they got up and walked out of the church unchanged, whereas I simply made a decision. That's what repentance is. Repentance is a decision. If it comes with emotion, that's great. But emotion is not a requirement to repent. You don't even have to feel bad about your sin. You just have to acknowledge this is wrong. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm making a decision, a change of mind to think differently, to act differently, to be different. Repentance really was a military term, which meant about face. I'm turning around. 
I'm making a decision. I'm going to be different. That is what the word repent means. And it's so important that Jesus began his ministry with the word repent. Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus birthed his ministry with the word repent. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when the apostle Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, the church was born with the word repent. Peter was preaching. The people listening to him said, tell me, what what must we do? And Peter answered them simply and said, repent. Repentance is the birth canal through which people enter into the kingdom of God. And if you don't come through the canal of repentance, then you never came. This is God's requirement. In fact, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 17, and I just want to read to you what it says. Acts chapter 17, the Bible tells us that Paul was preaching and Paul said to his listeners, there was a time when God winked at sin, but now God commands all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere. It is all inclusive. It embraces everyone. Doesn't matter what color you are or what nationality you are or high, high, how high or how low is your level of education or your economic status. God commands all men everywhere to repent. This is God's requirement. Repentance, not an emotion. Repentance is a decision. And here's the good news. You can decide to be different. You may not be able to drum up emotions, but you can look at something realistically and say, wow, I understand that I'm wrong. God's requiring me to repent. This is foundational. What is repentance? It is so foundational that the writer of Hebrews uses the word Thamelios, this should be set in stone in your life. And the good news is anybody has the ability to make a decision, which means you have the ability to repent at any moment that you need to repent. It's in your hands. It's in your ability to do. And we're out of time. But I'll be back in just a moment. Do you want to lead in life? Lead in your job. Lead your coworkers. You can learn to lead today with Rick Renner's book, Promotion. To be a leader, you don't have to be perfect, but you must be willing to grow. In this book, Rick answers the hard questions about the often misunderstood subject of leadership and how you can develop the critical character traits you need to get a promotion. Each chapter, Rick reveals the keys and questions for personal growth, as well as a comprehensive asset test for leadership. In this book, you'll learn the non-negotiable traits that determine if you or someone else is ready to progress in rank, position, or influence, and the practical ways to achieve your desired success. If you are already in leadership, Promotion teaches you the 10 keys every leader must apply to be successful and to build an unbeatable team and how to mentor promising leaders so they become top-notch producers who please God. When you call or go online today and get promotion, you'll learn the significance of the standards you keep and the relationships you hold. Whether you're seeking advice on when, how, and who to promote, or you want to hold a leadership position, Promotion prepares you for leadership. This resource is a trusted source of America's top leadership coaches. Order your copy right now for just $18. Don't miss this special offer, Promotion. Call now or go to renner.org to order. My name is Joel Renner, coming to you from Moscow, Russia. And I want to say thank you to all of our ministry partners. Your help is helping us change the lives of people all around the world, especially the street kids of Moscow. Moscow is home to over 20 million people and many children with special needs, but especially children who live on the streets. Because of our partners, we're able to help assist the House of Mercy impact homeless children. House of Mercy is a foster home that has rescued hundreds of children from the streets or from other bad situations and has given them a new chance at life. One of these children is Vita. He was abandoned as a toddler and was raised by dogs until he was rescued by the House of Mercy. Some call this the Mowgli Syndrome, a name taken from the character from the classic jungle 
single book story. Because of your gift and the work we are doing at the House of Mercy, Vita is now a healthy child. He is going to school, is being restored, after receiving spiritual, emotional, and physical care by the House of Mercy. This is just one story of how the House of Mercy has helped hundreds of children reclaim their lives and fulfill their destinies. This is all possible due to the partners who support our work. Will you consider becoming a partner so that we can continue changing other homeless children's lives like Vita? There are so many more children who need the help of the House of Mercy. Will you show them your care today by giving a gift of any size? When you give, you show the love of Jesus to these precious children. Right now, right from your home, you can help us help others by becoming a partner in this important work. Please call or go to renner.org to make a donation of any amount. Your financial support is helping us change the lives of children, children just like Vita. It is such a pleasure to be with you and to break open the Word of God and teach it to you. And I pray that today my teaching on repentance has been a help to you. Now, when we come back, we're going to continue and see what is faith toward God. That's the next doctrine that you need to be established in. These are so very vital. And I don't want you to miss one of these programs. You need to know these are the ABCs of your faith. And if these are in your life, then you'll have a platform on which to build the rest of your spiritual life. So it's essential that you have them. But today, as we close, I want to remind you of my book that we're offering you called Promotion. Actually, the full title is 10 Guidelines to Help You Achieve Your Long-Awaited Promotion. There's all kinds of promotions. There's financial promotion. There's vocational promotion. There's spiritual promotion. All kinds of promotions. I know in the local church, people are wanting more authority, more ministry. They're wanting more visibility. Nothing wrong with that. But how do you know if you're ready or what do you need to do to get ready for a promotion? What do you need to do to qualify in the sight of God for greater authority and greater responsibility? That's a vital question. And that's why I wrote this book and I want you to have it. Just contact us at the number that's on the screen or write to us at our website or call us or write us. We're here for you. We want to get this book into your hand. But I want to pray for you today before we close. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus for this time in the Word of God. We thank you that your Word is so powerful. We thank you for the power of repentance. And Lord, that we do not have to depend on our emotions to change. That we can see what you say, hear what you say, make a decision to obey, and do it. The act of repentance. We thank you for the power to make a decision to do what is right. We thank you for this. In the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. Thank you for being with me today. I'll see you in the next program. And remember, where the word of a king is, there is power. Rick Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity.